So all this week and today, we've been celebrating the launch of Apollo 11 and the moon landing. That's right. And earlier in the week, I look back at the impact of this and kind of where we're going forward. Take a look at that now. We have a liftoff. Lift off on Apollo 11. The launch of Apollo 11 and the moon landing won the space race with Russia. President Kennedy, to his credit, he really understood what this country is capable of doing, you know, and he, he challenged the country to go to the moon. It was just a remarkable point in our history. In 1984, Lehigh professor and retired astronaut Terry Hart spent a week in space repairing a satellite. And he says despite no landing since 1972, the moon is still very much in NASA's orbit. NASA's concept right now is to build what they're calling a deep space gateway on the other side of the moon in orbit. That Hart says will lead us to Mars. It's just a question of our political will uh, to do it, uh, and we will. Aided by the likes of Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson as the commercialization of space takes hold. This is the main piece of equipment we have here for training. And this is the high-performance human centrifuge. That replicates the G-forces of space flights. Bucks County-based NASTAR Center is a military and civilian training center for aircraft and space flights. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic crew has trained here. And this 4,000 horsepower, 25-foot arm is the only centrifuge in the world that civilians can train on, which I found out during an extreme adventure in 2008. It's not all that different in terms of the body 50 years ago compared to no. today. No. Uh, the astronauts that go to the space station, the Apollo astronauts, they all got G training. Facility director Glenn King and Dr. C. Wynn Fan say the training hasn't changed since that moon landing. But with Mars being the next goal, there is a new physiological frontier. We're talking even now about genetically engineering humans to endure those types of space flights. A flight well worth the view. The photographs are spectacular, of course, but when you see uh, the world in three dimensions from space, uh, it's just breathtaking. Good luck and Godspeed. And so now Terry is actually joining us in the studio to talk a little bit about his experience and that sort of thing. So Terry, you know, thanks for joining us. Back in 1978, you were one of 35 people chosen by NASA to be part of uh, this project known as Group 8. And so the first question, though, because I know you were up in space, how long did it take for you to master the trick of, of grabbing the spoon in, in <laughs> mid-flight as it went up that we saw in the piece there? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, Bo. You, you train for years to get it ready. And, and the the best part of the training is you get to talk to the people that have been there before, the astronauts who have been to the moon and, and uh, in space, and you learn a lot from them. Uh, but first, your first exposure to space, though, is still a uh, wide-eyed experience, and it, you feel very awkward at first in weightlessness. Um, um, but after a day or two, you get used to that, and then, of course, the view out the window is, is spectacular. I, I'm, I'm curious when you come back, right, and mm -hmm. your spoon's not floating in front of you, was that <laughs> weird to get back to normal when you return? Well, it depends on how long you've been up. If, uh, a mission uh, like a week or so, the typical space shuttle mission, eh, it takes you two or three days to feel normal. Uh, when you first go to get out of your chair, you feel like you weigh about 500 pounds <laughs> you know, because you're used to moving right. your body around with your fingertips. But after a day or two, it's fine. But if you've been up for longer periods of time, like six months or a year, it may take you a month to, re to recover fully. Wow. Now, you were back there in 19, or up there, I should say, in 1984 as part of the uh, uh, Challenger mission, and, right. you, and you were re repairing a satellite. We so did you the first repair of a satellite, yeah. So what's it like working in space? Did you get the suit on? Were you mm -hmm. out? outside and um, well I trained for doing that we had a crew of five and two of us did spacewalks a pinky and ox I think he saw some footage just now so is that before or after Michael Jackson's <laughs> moonwalk right I think it was right about the same time yeah. I think he, he learned from NASA I think uh, but we uh, we uh, did that first repair the first rendezvous of the space shuttle program which was my part with my uh, commander Bob Crippen but when you leave the spacecraft and you're in the suit and you're out there and you see earth I mean what is it like are you nervous are you excited or just focus on the task at hand? Uh, the latter. You're, you're not so much nervous as you're really focused. You have to understand after maybe four or five years of training and thousands of people helping you get ready, uh, you feel a tremendous pressure to do your part correctly. Uh, and uh, so we focus very much on that.
But just looking at, at, at Earth, I mean, you said oh. the, the pictures just can't even do it justice when you're there and you see it. It's remarkable. I mean, you're looking out the window and uh, you see the Ganges River and then the Himalaya Mountains. Wow. And then a couple of minutes later, you look out the other window and here comes Australia. It's really a spectacular experience. So when you see hotels advertising room with a view, you're kind of like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> eh. You know, and, and we also talked about kind of looking forward. And I know you mentioned that the colonization of the moon you mm -hmm. think will happen. And you, and you think that'll happen relatively soon? We can do it. We can do it anytime uh, we make our mind up to do it. Uh, it's interesting because when Kennedy said we're going to the moon, so much had to be invented uh, during that decade to get us to the moon. To go to Mars, you know, we don't have to invent anything. <laughs> we have to build a lot of things. It's a logistics problem. Uh, and it just takes the political will to do it. We, we understand the science and we know how to do it today. They were mentioning in, in your story, you mentioned in your story, uh, I forget who it was that you interviewed, said that they may genetically modify humans to go up. Do you know what they're talking about with that? That's uh, uh, not too much. I think it, it would uh, possibly be... Um, uh, was it, I think it was, it, with, it, it was with, like stem cells yeah. and, and kind of just having people being able to like handle radiation handle the long flights, you know, that kind of thing. So, right. The yeah. radiation's key, Bo. That's one of the biggest problems. And our bones tend to dissolve in weightlessness. You get osteoporosis. So that's another problem they've been working on in the space station. You know, um, the radiation's the, the tough one. You know, and, and the White House uh, says that they want to get back to the moon by 2024. Um, do, do you think, that, is, is that uh, ambitious? Do you think that can happen? Do you think it will happen? Sure, it can happen. Well, like I said, we have everything we, we need now. We're building a very big rocket now. NASA is building a Saturn V class rocket called the Space Launch System. It'll be tested next year on man. Uh, so that has all the capabilities to go back to the moon and to Mars. You can do everything that you saw in, in the movie The Martian. Uh, we're, we're building that kind of hardware now. But you said there's a difference between orbiting Mars and being able to actually land on Mars. It's, it's, two, it's two separate things, and you said the physics of it make it very difficult to actually land on Mars. When you go down to a planet, you're going down into a gravity well, so you have to get back, back out of that. Uh, I explained to my students, you know, picture a uh, rocket here on Earth that's designed to go to Mars. Big rocket, right? Right. To get from Mars back to Earth, we got to build that rocket on the surface of Mars. Yes, yeah, so not an easy thing to do. So you'll be there for a while building that? Uh, it will take a while. It's a, again, it's a logistics problem. We know how to do it, um, but we just have to get all the materials together and, and take one step at a time to, to make it happen. You know, and you also mentioned the commercialization of space. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk. Is that is that a good thing to starting to send civilians up into space and, the, and does that actually kind of spur the government to kind of push its boundaries? I, I think it's a good thing, um, uh, step by step. The really big leaps, I think, have to be done by the government. Although Elon Musk says that he thinks he can finance a trip to Mars. Uh, but but uh, uh, the big risky uh, programs, uh, like the early space uh, missions, uh, really uh, should be funded by the government. But uh, in the, in the, in the follow-up to that, though, there's plenty of room for commercial operations. And we really went to the moon. It we wasn't did. staged. <laughs> it wasn't staged. No. Huh? <laughs> it would be harder to stage it than it would be to actually do it. <laughs> well, well, Terry Hart, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. And, and I'm glad you got back. You <laughs> yeah, know, I know you, it was though. 35 years ago, but I'm glad you made it back. It was real nice being with you this morning. Yeah, thanks again. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll be back after this.